So a few weeks ago, I started making my way through a book entitled The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World by Ian McGilchrist. And uh, it was, this book was referred to, uh, was, was recommended and uh, started reading it. And uh, I have to say it's really tedious, extremely difficult, verbose reading but uh, there's a lot of gold nuggets to be mined out of there if you have the, the tenacity to go and get it. Uh, but right at the end of the introduction, last two paragraphs of the introduction, there was something that really uh, impacted me that I'd like to share. The uh, implications should be obvious and the value which, which this has. I'm just gonna read this, if I may. He says, there is a story in Nietzsche, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, um, that goes something like this. There was once a wise spiritual master who was the ruler of a small but prosperous domain, and who was known for his selfless devotion to his people. As his people flourished and grew in number, the bounds of this small domain spread, and with and with it the need to trust implicitly the emissaries he sent to ensure the safety of its ever more distant parts. It was not just that it was impossible for him to personally order all that needed to be dealt with. As he wisely saw, he needed to keep his distance from and remain ignorant of such concerns. And so he nurtured and trained carefully his emissaries in order that they could be trusted. Eventually, however, his cleverest and most ambitious vizier, the one he most trusted to do his work, began to see himself as the master and used his position to advance his own wealth and influence. He saw his master's temperance and forbearance as weakness, not wisdom, and on his missions on the master's behalf adopted his mantle as his own. The emissary became contemptuous of his master, and so it came about that the master was usurped, the people were duped, the domain became a tyranny, and eventually it collapsed in ruins. It's a long paragraph. The meaning of this story is as old as humanity and resonates far from the sphere of political history. I believe, in fact, that it helps us understand something taking place inside ourselves, inside our very brains, and played out in the cultural history of the West, particularly over the last 500 years or so. Why I believe so forms the subject of this book. I hold that, like the master and his emissary in the story, though the cerebral hemispheres should cooperate, they have for some time been in a state of conflict. The subsequent battles between them are recorded in the history of philosophy and played out in the seismic shifts that characterize the history of the Western cultures. At present, the domain, our civilization, finds itself in the hands of the vizier who, however gifted, is effectively an ambitious regional bureaucrat with his own interests at heart. Meanwhile, the master, the one whose wisdom gave the people peace and security, is led away in chains. The master is betrayed by his emissary. So I, I, uh, I just wanted to refer you all who might be watching to um, maybe uh, pick up that book or at least contemplate the message here. Uh, the idea that uh, there are those who claim to be emissaries or claim to be ambassadors or representatives of God Almighty, um, especially within the, uh, uh, within organized religions who, rather than point to Jesus Christ and who, rather than truly standing for goodness, virtue, wisdom, repentance, and uh, taking upon ourselves the nature and character of Christ rather than doing all those things they point to themselves and they seek to themselves become a power and have uh, dominion and glory 
uh, within within the sphere. And so uh, it's a, it's it's a the stands is a warning to everybody. Uh, as we as we go forward as as servants as we try to uh, share uh, the gospel with others as we. Uh, maybe even get some notoriety or whatnot we need to be very very careful that we are being absolutely humble meek and mild and uh and understanding and remembering the 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 seeds of evil that that are in each of us potentially uh recalling that uh in the account of the pre-mortal sphere that Lucifer was a son of the morning. He stood in the presence of God. and He was accounted among the, the wise and uh, um, some of them of the elect and the choice, choicest servants of God. But uh, he rose to vanity and he, he insisted that uh, his way was better and uh, he was cast down and he became Lucifer. He became Satan. And so, so each of us need to remember that and uh, uh, keep in mind our limitations and uh, realize that uh, all of us can fall, all of us can become prideful um, and arrogant. Someone once said that arrogance is the attitude that what you do not know, what you do not understand is not important. Um, and uh, so often what you don't know, what you don't understand, or what you do not respect because it's unknown or not understood, those are, those are uh, the seismic beginnings for our utter destruction and ruin. And so it behooves us to be absolutely humble and meek and mild and uh, uh, very, 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 very patient and, and temperate as, as we as we go forward and as we uh, uh, form our relationships. And another book I've been reading. Let me grab that. So while I'm on the topic. Uh, a few, a few weeks ago, I had referred to me a movie that's on Amazon called 13 Lives about the Thai cave rescue that happened some years ago. Uh, the movie 13 Lives is absolutely amazing. I absolutely recommend watching it. I've, I've now watched it many times, but uh, in the aftermath of that, I uh, watched the documentary I found uh, on YouTube, and then I bought this book right here. Uh, it's entitled. It's by John Volanthan, one of the uh, one of the cave rescue divers that helped get those thirteen boys that were trapped in that cave out of there. Um, it's entitled Thirteen Lessons That Saved Thirteen Lives." And so I've I've really enjoyed this book. Uh, I started a few days ago. I'm already um, about two thirds of the way through it. And uh, this last chapter I was just reading had uh, had something that I just thought was profoundly wise and helpful. I wanted to share. I feel impressed to share. Um, lesson number nine. Uh, he, he has a two paragraph introduction here before he launches into the chapter, but he says, sometimes when a crisis situation develops around us, it's tempting to want to rush into action and to fix things and to fix things now. However, the reality is that some crisis events play out like a game of chess in which rushing headlong into a poorly thought out plan of attack or defense can be the worst thing to do. Mistakes are made, key pieces are lost, and accidents happen along the way. Through rushing, we find ourselves maneuvering 
and to checkmate. Instead, it's sometimes better that we hurry up and do nothing. I know this sounds counterintuitive, but by pausing for breath in the first three seconds of a dispute, accident, or failed plan, or by making a little room to think in a situation where the clock isn't against us, we can plot our escape away from trouble, all the while using haste rather than speed. So in this book, he, 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 uh, as he uh, recounts the events of the Thai cave rescue, he weaves into it the, uh, these lessons, and then he also tells the stories of, uh, of many other uh, cave diving uh, experiences he'd had in the past. And it is, to me, it's astonishing the fine line between life and death that exists uh, and the, the realities of doing these, these deep dives into these subterranean caves. Uh, it's a situation where you're going hundreds of meters down, going through a tunnel, and then going into these caverns, and when you come back out again, it'll take you 12 hours uh, just to make the slow, slow uh, ascent back up to the surface to decompress uh, so you don't get the bends and so you don't have all kinds of medical problems or even die. And uh, you, when, you're, when you're going through these caves, you have all this silt and it gets kicked up. Often, often the visibility is nil. You can't see anything at all. And you'll get in situations where, where you absolutely have seconds to respond correctly or incorrectly. And if you do the wrong thing, it's going to cost you your life. And he, he, he tells one experience where the, the correct response was to simply do nothing and... Uh, be very very still and wait for about 15 20 minutes for the silt to settle so you could see what was going on but uh, you know in our relationships that that also is can can be absolutely key when we have disputes when we have misunderstandings sometimes the best thing to do is just let things slide for a while uh, I've, I've made some mistakes in my in my life recently where there's a misunderstanding and I came in and I started saying, hey, you know, there's a mistake or whatever. And uh, um, rather than being humble and saying, hey, you know, what, what went wrong here? I came charging in and the perception was that I was rushing in with both fists swinging and that was not, not what I was <laughs> intending at all. And uh, there was great misunderstanding because I, because of my haste and because because of my uh, my manner. And so, in in our relationships, we need to be really humble. And if if someone's upset, then the best thing to do is uh, maybe do nothing for a while, and then simply ask what's wrong and listen and uh and be be understanding uh, someone said a wise man seeks first to understand and then to be understood a wise man seeks first to understand and then to be understood and so i realize that's kind of a hodgepodge of different thoughts that i've shared here uh, quoted two very very different books but uh I hope these are some things for you to think about and, and to help you along as you try to uh, uh, more accurately perceive the reality and uh, more wisely respond to the uh, various little messes we find ourselves in. But uh, I, I would definitely recommend watching that movie 13 Lives and getting this book by John Fulanthan entitled 13 Lessons That Saved 13 Lives. The Thai Cave Rescue is right here. It's awesome. For me also, I like it a lot because it has lots of, uh, um, you know, dealing with these emergency situations and high risk complex environments. You know, as a, as a uh, professional pilot out there flying jets and turboprops, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, um, it's, it's, it's not uncommon to find yourself in situations where you need to understand uh, these kinds of rules and, and this kind of wisdom so that you don't mess up. And uh, everyone seems to like it when, when you don't crash. So uh, anyway, hope, that, hope that's interesting and, and, 
It helps a few people.